Hello, everyone. Today, I'd like to talk about the overview of research process,、um, about how people conduct the research, and how you will conduct the research on your own in your fourth year. So, even though、um, there is no specific order to conduct the research in general. Um, but research typically starts with a question. For your fourth year project or dissertation, you will be provided with a list of research questions to choose from. As you can see,、uh, some of the previous sample topics here. In case you don't find an interesting topic from the list, then of course you can come up with your own ideas and discuss with. Uh, discuss it with、um, you know one of the supervisors. In fact, it is always best to work with your own curiosity. However, once you pick your own topic to work with, then you still need to do something about it to make it more clearly defined and focused before you actually get to work with the topic. Right. So you. First, need to have your research question ready and suitable for your research.、Um, so, <clears throat> scientific research typically starts with a specific hypothesis. It is not always the case, but、uh, many times, if you're looking for, you know, how things occur, and you know why things occur, then you start、uh, your your research starts with a specific hypothesis. Which is basically a fancy word for a scientific question that should be testable and falsifiable. So, briefly, the testability of a hypothesis means that a hypothesis should、uh, generate specific expectations or predictions that can be tested with practical means or tools. So, for example,、um, if we say To do such and such to test an idea, then we should be able to expect or predict、uh, a certain outcome or result to follow or be observed. And secondly,、um, a hypothesis should be falsifiable or refutable,、um, of which concept was first introduced by a British philosopher named Karl Popper in 1959. So, in short, falsifiability arises when a set of relevant observations.、Um, so, meaning that when you collect the data,、um, then you should be able to、um, judge after you collect the data if the data or the collected evidence is either consistent or inconsistent with the hypothesis.、Uh, In fact,、um, no scientific idea is ever once and for all proven to be true. So,、uh, even the、uh, very well-known scientific knowledge, theories, ideas that we think established long time ago and accepted as facts, are still open to constant challenges and empirical validations. Therefore,、um, the hypothesis can only be shown to be wrong. So any scientific idea can only be supported, modified, or even be rejected by data or evidence. So let's consider the following statement as a kind of sample hypothesis to illustrate what makes a hypothesis testable or falsifiable. So say you have this conviction that dogs are better than cats. Um, personally, I love cats more than I do dogs, and I can probably give you hundred reasons why I do so. But in you know, all these reasons,、uh, can be subjective and it is not measurable. So let's try to be scientific here and think about the statement、uh, whether it can be qualified as scientific hypothesis based on the two qualities that a hypothesis need to have. The testability and falsifiability. Well, if you think about it,、um, the statement is very difficult to test、uh, or refute, if not impossible, because it is too vague and 
somewhat too general, right? So let's fix the statement in a way that we can test and you know falsify um, by way of measuring things or collecting some evidence. So now um, let's change the hypothesis, and now it says the dogs are better than cats in climbing trees. Well, now this sounds a bit more specific than before, as now we know that the uh, what aspect of the animals we say better at. However, I think we need to be a, a little bit more specific about what we mean by better, as it can mean many different qualities. So now the hypothesis is changed to say that dogs are faster instead of just better than cats in climbing trees. So this way, um, you can probably agree that now we can finally test this hypothesis uh, by measuring how fast they can climb a tree. So after we gather the data, then we can use them to show whether the hypothesis is supported or not. Um, of course, there are other details you need to think about. Um, for example, uh, which breed uh, will be representing each camp? So, um, you know, with uh, you know, uh, with respect to dogs, um, should it be the beagle or poodle um, be representing the dogs, or how about Scottish fold for cats? And there are other things you need to actually um, uh, define some other details uh, to make this hypothesis uh, more clear. But as we will see later, this process of making your research hypothesis suitable for actual testing uh, is called operationalization. So we've talked about this, um, uh, the requirements of uh, hypothesis, then what is kind of a practical uh, ways to, you know, make a hypothesis a good one. So here are some tips. Um, so first, you know that you have a good research hypothesis when it is focused and clearly stated. And also, um, it's always better to have a well-defined um, single hypothesis rather than multiple hypotheses, especially if this is your first time doing research. Well, not every uh, research can have specific hypotheses because um, you know if the nature of your research is you know mainly descriptive or qualitative, uh, then you probably don't have a specific question um, to test the hypothesis by gathering uh, or collecting the uh, data. But even for that kind of exploratory. Uh, hypothesis-free studies, uh, you still need to have at least a purpose, aim, or goal for your study so that um, the audience um, knows that your hypothesis is uh, clearly identifying and explaining why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, once you have your research question ready, then you need to know more about the topic by studying the previous research in the area, and this is where you need to do your literature review. So it is very important that you review enough literature relevant to your research question to better understand the context from which your research hypothesis arises, because Scientific progress is made by an accumulation of previous knowledge, which is a collection of related hypotheses answered by past research. In addition, literature review will help you identify the most up-to-date information and the current state of affairs in the field, topic, or theme of your research. Literature review will also help you find the gaps in the field, that have not been fully investigated or need 
more research. And finally, a successful literature review will help you refine or redefine your research hypothesis and the scope of your research. Before you review literature, you need to first search and collect as many relevant literature as much as possible and save them. In old days, you would need to go to library, but these days, literature search cannot be easier than ever, thanks to the internet. You can start your search with major bibliographic databases, um, which is a specialized digital collection of references to publish literature, um, such as journal articles or books. For bio students like you, or probably PubMed, will be most relevant database to use, which is a database primarily dedicated to life sciences or biomedical topics. Um, you know, Google is always your best friend for any search, so you can use Google for the same purpose. Um, um, but, you know, they have a bit more specialized search engine called Google Scholar for literature search. Finally, another way to do a literature search is to use one of the citation indices. In fact, Citation Index is another type of bibliographic database, which is an index of citation between publications. This becomes particularly useful when you have a seminal paper or very important paper from the past that you think is the foundation of your research. Because it is quite common to start a new research based on the old research, Citation Index will be helpful to find out what has been done since the publication of the old paper to learn about the current state of the current state of the affair or gap in the research area. GCU has a license with the Web of Science, so you can use this citation index for free to do a literature search. You will have a chain you will have a chance to learn how to use these databases for your project or dissertation in much more detail in your fourth year. If you're doing your literature search for a study and planning to write an academic paper later, you must, I will say this again, you must use one of the reference management software, which is a specially de developed program for authors to easily manage collected literature for publication. I cannot emphasize enough how useful it can be once you get to um, use it. So this is a, you know, basically the lifesaver. Um, they're basically integrated with word processing software such as Microsoft Word. Um, they can populate formatted bibliographies, reference pages, or inline citations to any preferred style or recommended style such as Harvard or uh, APA style with a few button clicks. You will have a chance to learn more about you know, how to use one of these software in your fourth year and make sure that you attend the session to learn how to use them. GCU has license with RefWorks um, in the middle, right? So um, you will get to learn how to work with RefWorks uh, in that session. But if you don't um, like it for whatever reasons, there are tens of, if not hundreds, other reference managers out there. And I can recommend either Zotero on the left or Mendeley because they are free, easy to use, and pretty much platform independent. So once you finish collecting the relevant literature, then you need to review them individually because not all the collected literature will be directly relevant to your research question, and you're not gonna be including all of them in the reference section. Therefore, you wanna quickly exclude literature by reading the title and abstract first, then sift further to pick out the most relevant literature to read in full. 
So when I was a student, actually, I found this step、uh, most demanding and time consuming, as the、uh, journal articles or the scientific paper are usually very difficult to read to begin with.、Um, moreover, reading a research paper is different from reading a textbook. You do not read it to find direct answer or crystal clear evidence to your question, and if you do. Then why would you do your own research when you already found the answer from reading, right? And when you read a full paper,、uh, you first try to understand the research question of the paper and read closely how they arrive their answers from the question. So the very first thing you want to do is to identify the hypothesis if there is one. And if not, try to identify at least the goal, aim, or purpose. So basically, you need to、um, identify why they're doing what they're doing, and whenever possible,、um, rephrase the question in your own words to clarify what you think they're doing is what they're actually doing as you read along. And for literature review. Um, you need to be intentionally judgmental throughout to、uh, throughout the uh, uh, the process to find out if the entire、uh, Q and A process, so basically that is Q and A process,、um, is sound and logical, and to select quality evidence related to your research. So you have to be willing to wonder constantly and keep asking yourself. Questions and stay skeptical.、Um, asking, you know, questions like, you know, are the evidence or data、um, good enough to support or refute the original study question? Or you can ask questions like, you know, if the methodology is valid to answer the research question, or you know, whether or not the rationale leading to the claim or conclusion. Um, is logical and reasonable.、Um, is there any oversimplification or sweeping generalization in their conclusion? And while you're reviewing this literature, you also want to watch out for hidden assumptions and biases. And whenever possible, consider other viewpoints or alternative interpretation. And finally,、um, be willing to tolerate uncertainty, and this is unav-、uh, unavoidable, right? Because you know the journal articles are very difficult to read to begin with, and also、um, you're gonna、uh, come across a lot of difficult terms,、uh, uh, words, paragraphs you probably don't understand, but you do not want to get stuck forever, so you wanna. Uh, you 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 want to be ready to settle for tentative answers until you find further evidence or understand, and then you would just move on. So once you're done with literature search and review. Then you need to convert your research hypothesis into statistical hypotheses, which is a pair of refined research questions to be tested with a statistical model. Again, not every research question is subject to this process.、Um, if your research is mainly descriptive or qualitative in nature, in setting up statistical hypotheses. You need to formulate two competing hypotheses so that they are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. Here,、um, the mutual exclusivity means that there should be no overlap between the two statements, so that only one of the statements can be chosen after a statistical test. And、um, mutually exhaustive. Uh, means that the two statements should cover all conceivable possibilities. So let's just、uh, take a look at an example. 
Um, so let's consider the following research question, whether or not taking lutein supplement is good for vision. So lutein is a chemical known to be concentrated in the macula, uh, which is responsible for the most accurate vision um, in the back of, your, uh, back of the eye. So in some big studies on uh, AMD, right, um, age-related macular degeneration, uh, the data suggested that the chemical may have some beneficial effect on slowing down the progress of the disease. However, um, it is not very clear if the substance will be beneficial to normal vision in general. Well, let's assume that you think it will be, and you want to conduct research. And in this case, your research hypothesis will be that lutein is good for good for vision, right? And now, um, to have a complete statistical hypothesis, you need another hypothesis, uh, which is called a null hypothesis, to complement your research hypothesis. In this case, the null hypothesis going against your research hypothesis saying that lutein is not good for vision. So you can think of the null hypothesis as a kind of a devil's advocate. Now the null and research hypothesis are mutually exclusive in that they both cannot be true at the same time. And also, they are mutually exhaustive because together they cover all the possibilities. So the lutein will be either good or not good, right? So this actually covers all the possibilities, basically. So if you think about the research question again, is lutein good for vision? then it sounds too general for a practical investigation and does not capture what we want to do to test the hypothesis. So um, you probably remember I briefly mentioned this uh, before uh, about the uh, opera uh, operationalization, right? And so if you think about this, uh, if we go back to this question again, is lutein good for vision? You know, what do we mean by good or bad? And what do we mean by vision? Is it something measurable at all? So you need to make your research question more specific and suitable for statistical testing by way of operationalize, uh, operationalizing the relevant variables uh, you want to measure. So what is operationalization? Um, this process can be defined as a process of detailing your research question further to a practically testable or measurable specification. So this process enables abstract or general ideas or concepts empirically observable or measurable by breaching them uh, with relevant measurements that are thought to represent the ideas or concepts. So in doing so, we need to consider the most optimal uh, uh, or relevant variables to measure to answer the research question. For example, um, visual acuity can be one aspect of vision. Then we can say uh, that you know having a, vi a better visual acuity can be a good thing for vision or vice versa so i just um, mentioned the variables and the variables are basically the things or constructs that change in either a set of attributes categories traits or qualities and if things are changing in this kind of properties then we can call these variables as qualitative or categorical variables. Examples of such variables are a sex or colors of someone's hair or eye because the values we can assign to these variables are qualities or categories. 
In fact, nominal or ordinal level of measurements are these kind of variables. On the other hand, if a variable changes in a characteristic taking on different amounts or numerical quantities, then we call these kind of variables quantitative variable. So in terms of levels of measurement, interval or ratio level of measurements are the examples of such variables. So as we learned already, it is very important to correctly identify these variables in a study because it determines the kind of statistics you can calculate to summarize those variables. When the goal of a study is to examine the changes or relationship between any two variables, then each has different names depending upon the role they play in the investigation. The response variable measures an outcome of a research or study, so it is also known as an outcome measure or outcome variable. In the Latin example, the response variable will be the visual acuity, and this visual acuity is assumed to change as a consequence of changes in the, in the exploratory variable, which is lutein. And the response variable is sometimes known as a dependent variable because the response or the measurement of this variable is dependent upon the changes in the exploratory variable. So the exploratory variable basically explains or influences changes in a response variable even though it may or may not be one of the direct causes of the changes in the response variable. Now let's take a look at the following example studies to see if we can identify response or explanatory variables in each study. The first one is to investigate the relationship between the typical amount of alcohol a person consumes per day and the change in the level of alcohol in blood after an hour of drink. So in this study, the response variable or explanatory variable is quite obvious, where the response variable is the change in the level of alcohol in blood after an hour of drink because this is the outcome or the consequence of drinking a typical amount of alcohol which is the explanatory variable because this variable is responsible for the change in the level of alcohol in blood after an hour. Now let's move on to the next study where it says the NHS collects information across the UK population regarding body height and weight to document the overall characteristics of the population. In this case, it is not very clear if there is a response or explanatory variable, even though it is clear that NHS is measuring two variables, which are weight and height. However, it is not made clear, at least in um, the paragraph, whether they are necessarily looking at some kind of dynamics or relationship between these two variables or whether there is any change between these two variables. So we assume that their goal is merely to describe the physical characteristic of the population and they're not necessarily looking at any relations between the variables. So in this case, we do not have a specific response or explanatory variables. Right, so um, we've been talking about the uh, statistical hypothesis and this pair of statistical hypotheses uh, have special name. So the null hypothesis is um, the statement about the uh, values of unknown response variable when no effect is assumed. So when you're setting up a null hypothesis, um, uh, typically no change, no difference, no relationship is expected or assumed. And this is the hypothesis you want to refute 
in favor of alternative hypothesis or H1. And this is typically your research hypothesis you want to support. And sometimes the null hypothesis is called H0 or H0. So if we just go back to the, our lutein example, then the corresponding null hypothesis for that study will be like overall taking lutein will make no difference in visual acuity. So this is going to be the null of that lutein study. So this is an example null hypothesis you can set up. On the other hand, the alternative hypothesis is basically the opposite statement against the null hypothesis H0. So typically, you assume a change, difference, or relationship in the response variable when you're setting up uh, alternative hypothesis. And as I said, this is typically your research hypothesis that you want to support against the null hypothesis. So um, in the lutein example, the alternative hypothesis will be overall taking lutein will make a difference in visual acuity. Once you have your statistical hypotheses, then you need to think about how you will design your research. In fact, setting up statistical hypothesis is closely related to the research design as operationalization is all about the research design. First and foremost, a research project must be feasible within the available resources, such as time and money. So you should be able to uh, complete and finish your project given the time and money. Therefore, there are lots of things you need to consider. For example, how many subjects or participants you need to recruit for the project. In general, the more you have, the better your outcome will be, but you know you cannot have an infinite number of subjects, so you need to decide how many will be enough for your project. And who will be your subject? Humans or animals? Normals or patients? Your hypothesis will also play a role in selecting the type of subject. And measurement is directly related to the data collection. And for a quality data collection, you need to choose carefully what you measure is what you intend to measure. There can be a multiple ways to or equipment to measure the same construct. For example, to measure visual acuity, there can be many different ways to measure it depending upon the purpose of your research. If your research involves human subject, then you need to go through the ethics board. When there are special population or patients, then you need to take extra steps to ensure their well-being. Finally, you need to think about the actual design of your research. Research design can be categorized in different ways based on the different aspects of research. So, for example, a research can be mainly qualitative or quantitative depending upon the nature of data collected. So, if you intend to collect the data in the form of words or media, and this kind of research uh, can be categorized as qualitative research. And most of the qualitative research are usually exploratory and descriptive. On the other hand, if the data are collected in the form of numbers, then this kind of research is categorized as quantitative research and the data collected in this form are subject, subject to further numerical analysis, unlike the qualitative research design. 
On the other hand, a research can be categorized into either descriptive or analytic research, uh, depending upon the goal of the study or the purpose of the study. If you are mainly interested in measuring and summarizing the pattern or frequency of a variable of interest, then um, this kind of research is categorized as descriptive research design. On the other hand, if you are interested in the dynamics between the variables based on the descriptive data collected on those variables, then this type of research is categorized as analytic design. So in analytic design, a hypothesis about the variables are formally tested to find out the nature of the dynamics between those variables. Research can also be categorized into observational or experimental based on the role of the investigator. In an observational study, the investigators uh, merely act as bystanders watching, measuring, or investigating the variables, variables of interest without attempting to change any of those variables under investigation. On the other hand, the investigator in the experimental design will be actively involved in manipulating one or more exploratory variables to see their effects on the other response variables. This design is almost always analytical where hypotheses about the relationship between the variables are formally tested. In fact, an observational study can be analytic at the same time too However, when a notable relationship is observed between the variables of both observational and experimental design, then it is only the experimental design to be able to say something about the causal relationship between the variables, assuming that the experimental study is carefully controlled. However, you cannot suggest this kind of a causation from the seemingly same result of the observational study because of several reasons that we will see later in this lecture. So before we talk about those differences in design between the correlational uh, observational and experimental design, let's talk about why a simple correlation between the two variables does not necessarily mean they are causally related because we make this false inference quite frequently. For now, just remember that correlation between two variables does not provide a sufficient evidence for them to be causally related, even though strong correlation is a necessary condition for a causal relationship. So you may heard that playing violent video games or watching violent TV makes children violent. Let's assume that you want to test this claim on your own and found very strong correlation between the two variables where playing violent video game is the explanatory variable and the violent personality or tendency or behaviors measured by frequency of uh, violent behaviors or languages is the response variable of the study. So your study suggests that the more you play the violent video games, the more violent you become. Assuming that the study was very well managed and designed and the evidence was legit, then what do you think would people take away from this study? So. This is the hypothetical result. On the horizontal axis, we have our explanatory variable A, which is the, um, the number of hours playing violent video game. And on the vertical axis, we have the response variable B, which is the violent behavior. As the data suggests, the more you play, the more violent behaviors are displayed, and this relationship is almost perfectly 
correlated. In this case, can we conclude that the original hypothesis is supported, meaning that violent video game is a true culprit behind the violent behavior? Well, it may be or may be not. Um, you know, when two variables change together or they are correlated with each other, their relationship is not necessarily causal. For example, it is possible that event A is the direct cause of B. If this is to be the case, then we can say that the original hypothesis is supported where playing violent video game is the direct cause behind the violent behaviors. However, we will see exactly the same relationship when B causes A2. If that is the case, then what that means is that uh, violent people are attracted to play more violent video games, not the other way around. So our assumption about the original hypothesis is completely reversed in this case. So if the reverse is a possibility, then these two variables can be perpetually causing each other. So in other words, the more you play violent video game, the more violent person you become. The more violent person you become, then the more you will seek out to play more violent video games. So I hope now you see where this is going. The take-home message here is that you cannot make a definite conclusion regarding the existence or the direction of a cause and effect relationship only from the fact that A and B are correlated. There can be two other possibilities behind the correlation, and we will take a look at different examples in the next slide. Okay, so the data in red are based on the official statistics from the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, whereas the data in black are from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention of the U.S. So what's on the graph is the yearly change in the U.S. spending on science, space, and technology, and the number of suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. The yearly changes in these two variables are plotted together on a double y-axis, where the left in red represents the U.S. spending and the right in black represents the number of suicides. Um, as it is obvious, two lines are running almost perfectly parallel. So what that means is that uh, they, increases, they increase hand in hand as years go by. So the more the U.S. government spends on science, space, and tech, the more people commit suicide. Oh wait, maybe it's the other way around. No matter how strange it may seem, the correlation between the two events is so strong that it is close to almost 100%. Now, do you think that this is a meaningful correlation at all? You don't think that U.S. spending on science, space, and technology somehow causes more people to commit suicide, do you? In fact, this is not the right way to explore a correlation between any two random events. However, you can make any two random events look like they are perfectly correlated with each other like this. If you're more interested, you can find more nonsense correlations between any two random events like this if you click the provided link here. Now, let's look at another relationship between the gambling and cancer. The graph you're looking at is suggesting that the more you gamble, then the more likely you will have cancer. Hmm. Unlike the previous correlation, this correlation is performed correctly in that these two variables are, completely, uh, are not completely random. They are actually paired variables. Uh, which should be when you are calculating correlation between any two events. So then, what is going on here? 
if you don't think the gambling is causing cancer, then what is going on behind this strong relationship? Even though we see this positive association between gambling and cancer, you probably agree that gambling is not the true cause behind the cancer. Then what else can we think about it? Well, if you think about you know, what people do when they gamble, then you will find more people to engage in unhealthy behaviors such as smoking and drinking. So the more you play, the more likely you lose and the more likely you get stressed out too. So from these, uh, you can infer that it is the unhealthy behaviors what are truly behind the cancer incidence, not the gambling itself. So what's really governing the relationship between the two events is the third event called uh, tertium quid in Latin, uh, Latin or a confounding variable. Therefore, we always need to be very careful not to mistake a mere correlation for a true causation because, um, you know, whenever we see a relationship between the two events or variables. One of the necessary conditions that needs to be established for a causal relationship between the two events is their temporal relationship. What that means is that cause always comes before the effect in time, not the other way around. However, this condition is not enough to say a relationship between any two events in time is causal just because something occurs before the other because anything can come before any event. However, this type of reasoning, uh, reasoning error called a post hoc fallacy is quite common in real life. The name came from Latin literally meaning after this, therefore because of this. The pattern of this fallacy goes like this. Event A occurred, then B followed, therefore the event A must be the cause of the event B because A came before B. This fallacy becomes all sources of magical thinking, jinx, or superstition. So far, we have looked at the different cases to illustrate why we should not assume a causal relationship too quickly, even when we face a strong correlation. Remember, Correlation does not imply causation.